With that, I think we will get started. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, just before we get started, just want to make sure that everybody is on mute. And uh, if you could please remain on mute for the entire session. What we'll do is uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask either Marcel or Elder Paul, uh, just please log those in the chat and we will um, uh, get to those as they come up. So on behalf of ACC, I'd like to, to welcome you to this event. So we're pleased to have you join us today to embrace culture, honor treaties, and take a step toward building a better future together as we recognize tomorrow, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, so ACC has a genuine commitment to truth and reconciliation as part of our larger comprehensive EDI strategy. And in honor and respect for First Peoples, the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all Indigenous peoples across the lands, we stand in solidarity, committed to understanding, learning, and fostering equitable relationships. Uh, so Marcel has already done protocol with Elder Marcel Paul. Um, so before we start this event, though, Elder Paul, will you please lead us in an opening prayer? Ready? Ready. Oh, Mamu Tangi Ma, a shame in a needy pot in Oka. We all muta, and it's a tie out on your Tushkian. And Shogama six was watch near Nani to Maganu Nani to know of Ma. Here on Shogama was watch near Tina Ganu Sky. Akomagan take it, take a comuta to the Gavin or Kota. And Shogama we all Mamu Tangi Ma. We start Mushomak, Muta, Nuchatayota. Akio Mota Pesh. We are only ten a gun, he can walk Mog Mosoma. In a sugar mouse, of course, we are a homagan to get there. We scare up ni ten a gun. In a sugar mouse, of course, it marks in it magnona. A hound and ashkuma, a nashkumpton. Care of eight bow motor steam on Eastern a paid bow motor mail. Hey, hey, no nash. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Paul, for your prayer and the wisdom you have shared with us. Uh, you have set a powerful and respectful tone for our gathering today. And with that, I would like to invite Marcel uh, to share a poem he has written for us, actually at five o'clock this morning. So you guys are the very first people to hear it. <laughs> Thank you, Shauna. Um, I wrote a poem as well last year. Um, I'm sure it's available, um, but yeah, I do write poetry and stuff and I do have a passion for writing. So I did, I woke up early this morning and um, I, you know, I, I lit my smudge and stuff. And then uh, this poem came to me. It's uh, called The Collective. Collectively, we remember the 30th of September for those we lost and never found. Reflection and remembrance spreads a positive message all around. Be a voice of compassion as fierce as fire. Listen to the stories of what has transpired. Become a beacon of support by using your mind, spirit, and heart. Collectively together, we dismantle what has driven us apart. Through the heart and listening to our survivors, we will gain a heightened perspective, unity, strength, compassion, for we are the collective. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. That was beautiful. And so now we're going to get into our presentations. We're going to start with Elder Paul. So um, it, it is always my honor to introduce Elder Marcel Paul. Uh, this is the second year he's joining us. Uh, Elder Paul is a devoted family man with a rich heritage. He's fluent in Cree and carries forth ancestral teachings from his grandfather and other elders. With a nine-year tenure as a council member and a degree in lands management, he passionately advocates for First Nations rights and passes on invaluable wisdom to the next generations. 
a skilled negotiator, Elder Paul's deep-rooted beliefs in mutual respect and fruitful partnerships drive his continued ad advocacy for a better future for First Nations people. I would like to invite Elder Paul to lead us through the first presentation as we delve into the historical and contemporary relevance of the treaties. Elder Paul, the floor is all yours. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's a great day today. We had a nice thunderstorm last night. And the grandfathers are saying, we'll see you again in the spring. So old man winter is coming now. We've got to get ready for him. So with that, I'll start my, my slides. So Itaskinio means our land, us, our people, everyone that live on Turtle Island and in the world. So we uh, have to agree to share. That's what we were always taught when we were young, growing up from my teachings of my grandfather. So that's what that word means, Cascatinio. So next slide. First and foremost, <clears throat> We, as the people of Treaty 6, Turtle Island, we agreed to share in unity together for a better tomorrow for our people. And in there, our hearts transition from me to we as, as a group, as we grow. There's more and more people coming, more and more walks of life. We have to make room to our, our young people for the history, our culture, and our teachings, and our way of life. It's very important to remember our way of life as we grow. I have lots of grandchildren, and I have to teach them. And through all my children that I have taught, I also they help teach the children every day. Next slide. And the medallion is a symbol a friendship between the queen and representatives that sign our treaties, all the number of treaties and the name treaties. And the crowns, there's three crowns that we we respect, the federal, the provincial, and the crown corporations. These things are so important because we agree to share, to share the land the six inches above, we agreed. That's what the teachings of our old people. We were never told to write these things down, to remember them. So they're all blueprinted in our brains as we go, as we get older and older. And we have to continue to be the teachers. Like I said earlier, teaching my children, and my children help me to teach my grandchildren. And if the Creator blesses me, I might see my great-grandchildren someday. So it's very important how this treaty medallion is so sacred. Next slide. The fundam the fundament founded foundational of our beliefs on Turtle Island is very secret. Because you gotta remember this land is bored from the generations that are yet to come. We only have a right to use this land. We don't own it, none of us. We only have the right because the babies are coming. And as time evolves, our babies will always share for seven generations ahead. The medallion is so important to understand what it means living on Mother Earth, breeding with Mother Earth, sharing with everything with Mother Earth. Mother Earth is 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 the is the reason why we all survive. Money is not everything. There's a lot more. The one from money. And it's very important that economic prosperity has to be shared with everyone, especially the First Nations people, because we're here first. And there's a lot of other nationalities in, in our country, First Nations people. There's the Métis people, the Inuit people. We have to also think of them to help them, because we all agreed to share Mother Earth with the Gotayokan. Next slide. 
and the continued beliefs is the four directions, north, south, east, and west, the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, the four elements, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, the four elements of nature, fire, water, earth, and wind, the four main animals, the eagle, the bear, the wolf, the buffalo, and the four components of a human, the mind, the body, the soul, and the spirit. The shape of the medicine wheel represents the cycle of life in which we are all in, in there in that wheel. We have a hub, we have a wheel, and we are the spokes. So when you look at the colors, they're all there. And we have to put the spokes and fill in where do we all fit? How do we all share? How do we all agree to work together for a better tomorrow? Because it's about the babies, this land. The earth, it belongs to the unborn, and that's all our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth, the seven generations. Next slide. As long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the river flows. Our ancestors, through ceremony, many days they sat in guidance, and they talked in negotiations to make the treaty with the Queen's representatives. Our understanding and shining representing a newborn baby, shining like the sun when he's born. And the grass that grows is that same baby, from a baby to a child, to an adolescent, to an ad 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 adult, to an elder, back to Nutubuteyokan, where we come from, our mother, Mother Earth. So she carries us all the way through. And then when we pass, she, she puts us in a place where we rest for, for eternity. And the blood that flows, that's the river from the babies. Listen, matter if it's a mother or a father, it's the blood. That's the river that they talk about, the old people, the old teachings. And that's all in the treaty because it's the first provision and treaty. The second one is land, to be set aside and administered. We look after that land. It's so important that we protect Mother Earth. We'll take everything out, save some for the babies that are coming. Next slide, please. The wealth of the original people in our hearts, in our mind, in our souls, in our spirit. We're very rich. When it comes to the money, we're not very rich. We are kind of below the poverty line all the time. But these things were promised to us, and we never seen them yet. And it's so important that the NRTA, it has to be looked at from every side of life, every side of government, because that's where we agreed to share the depth of a plow of six inches. Everything underneath that, that's ours through the Indian Money's Trust Fund, which is called the Consolidated Trust Fund today. That's where our money is supposed to come from. We shouldn't be living in poverty with no, without good water, good sewer, good everything. And don't spill it on the ground, capture it. Use that water or something else. When If you make a lagoon, like for example, it has to happen on reservations as well as off reservations. Because it's so important that we take care of Mother Earth. Not the but Mother Earth, that's the one that gives us life. Like the ladies give us life, our mothers. So important to understand these things. And that NRTA is just getting bigger and bigger, but we're not getting our share financially. Well, we need to start looking at that too. This truth and reconciliation is so important to understand where we come from, we're not the greedy people. We were never taught like that. We were always taught to share. So at some point, hopefully our chiefs and our councils can break ground through the NRTA with the governments so that we can get a fair share. We don't want it all, even though it belongs to all of us, because we only agreed to share the depth of a plow. But we're not greedy people. We'll share with everybody and anybody, as long as it's within good reason and to save some for the babies that are coming in the next seven generations. Next slide, please. 
utilizing the, the, the tools of today for tomorrow. The sacred number of treaties and the territorial treaties and the wampum belt treaties and the 1970 red paper, citizens plus paper, and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People, and the TRC 94 calls to action. These are the things that we are fundamentally using to work with our brothers and sisters of all walks of life and governments to understand it's very simple. It's not hard. What we know, what we were taught, what we agreed to share, and how can we get to these things? And these are the tools that are here so that our babies can enjoy the same, a better way of life than what we have when I was growing up. We had no water. We had to pump. We had to pump some water. We had to go to the rivers and to the lakes to get water. Now today we turn on the tap, which is good, but that's still not good water. I have a well here. It's not good water, but I use it because that's all I have. So in order for me to make coffee and tea, I have to use bottled water. So every First Nation is like that. And that NRTA can help us fix those things. So that when we turn on the tap, our babies will have good water to drink because you got to have water. And we can't just throw it on the ground. You have to look at capturing that water and use it somewhere else. Maybe the drilling rigs could use it, you know, instead of using good water for that kind of stuff. I used to work in the oil and gas sector. I know what it's all about. I've been around a lot of work. I work in firefighting, forestry, the fires today. Like I did all of those kinds of things. I know the experiences. But if we don't sit together to come up with something that will help the future, because you got to remember one thing we are always taught. When the last tree is cut down and the last water hole is polluted, can you eat your money? I don't think so. So we need to protect. That's our jobs as people of today so that the seven generations can enjoy a better life for tomorrow. Next slide, please. Makamimo, keep going. That means keep going. The future is right there. But we need to build that together. And we have to do that through the chambers, through, through every kind of government that they put up, the Chamber of Commerce and all these things, because that's the heart. That's the heart that's beating right there. The government, they just give, and you do this, you do that, you do that. That's the same thing when we're in the chief and the council. All the directors make that thing happen for the leaders. And that's what the chambers is all about. And that's why I'm so happy to sit with you guys and, and to talk with you and to try to get something going for us as a people. And we can help you. We can get there together by helping and working together. It's so important to building that together for the future of, the, of tomorrow. We must always follow our path, no matter where you go. Strength and unity is unbreakable like many arrows. You're not going to break a lot of arrows, but you can break one arrow. These are things that are so important to understand. And we can explain these things to you. But when you sit in the meetings and discuss these kinds of things and put some legislative documents together so that we can all enjoy everything as a people. Because when I talk about a people, it's not just us. It's everybody, all the walks of life that we share Alberta with. And in Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8, and we have to also think of the Métis people. We also got to help them because they're a Métis people is, is part of everybody's walk of life that have two marital statuses and stuff to help one another to have people in our communities in the world, in the provinces. The next slide, please. The ones I prayed to. I prayed to the creator first when I did my prayer. Then I prayed to the peace of the sun and the moon, because they're one. One is called Isagal Pisum, that's the sun. Kipskal Pisum is the moon. They work together hand in hand as they go around. Mutagotayokan, Mother Earth. So important. And the Thunderbirds is the next one I prayed to, the eagles. They're the ones that have the strength and the sight 
for us to see the future, to understand. And the wind that we talk about, o tin, that's what gives us our breath, clears everything, the smoke of the fires of Mother Earth burning herself because it's contaminated. Notabutayukan works in many different kinds of ways to make sure she takes care of herself, just like the mother. When they get up in the morning, they comb their hair. Well, sometimes they have to put that, burn it or something. Eh? So that's what that is. And the food, the buffalo, is so important to understand that the animals that we eat today, they give us our feed, our food to eat, to grow. The buffalo, the cattle, the moose, the deer, the elk, they are there for us. And the bears and stuff. So that we understand that's where we get our nutrients from, our food. Very important in these gardens so that we don't use our sewers to, to contaminate our garden. It's not good what I see in our First Nations when I see water coming to the house and I see it going out of the house and it's just spit on the ground. It's not good. And we're trying to make a garden. And when you contaminate that, it needs to be captured with a bladder and use that water somewhere else. Because you're taking that same water that goes out and then it's gone. It goes down back into our drinking water. That's not good. When you see them. But they also keep slow. That's the teachings we were taught. Not the Wotayokan is the most important element of life, and that's our earth. Where we take, we, we, we don't, sometimes they don't take care of it, and then they'll have an earthquake or a flood or a fire, because Notokotayokan has to keep herself pure. So those are the things in the prayer that I talk about. These things are so important, because if we don't work together, unfortunately, the world won't be here. And these wars, I feel so sorry when I see that happen. I just cry a little bit. I pray for those people. I ask the creator to make them understand, don't do those kinds of things. And I watch the news. And I just feel so sorry for the people. It doesn't need to be a First Nation. I feel sorry for all the walks of life. Because I myself, I have an Indian mother and I have a white father. I have to understand when I walk both sides of that line to understand this side of the world and that side of the world. And I always tell that to my children and my grandchildren. Understand things. You got two ears to hear things twice. You got two eyes to see things twice. One mouth. Take it easy with your mouth. Learn. And understand, load your brain before you shoot your mouth off. These things I always tell my children. You guys are smarter than me, more educated. I went to university. I got a lens degree, but I also have a degree of my grandfather, of teaching me, my grandmother, to understand. So these things are so important that we work together in harmony so that we can live together in harmony and take care of Mother Earth and quit fighting over nothing. I thank you very much. You guys keep working together and keep going. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Elder Paul. And uh, I would just let everybody know that if you just have any questions uh, for Elder Paul, you can just log those into the chat and we'll ask them. Um, maybe I'll kick it off. Um, you often refer to seven generations. Uh, you know, in your in your presentation in terms of looking into the future and our forward thinking uh, in terms of also your traditional thinking. So I'm just wondering if you could explain, Elder Paul, the significance of the seven generations. Seven generations right now. In our community, we're at seven, especially my family, the Paul family. And it started from time immemorial. And I talk about the treaty. So before that, there were seven generations prior to that also. So every seven generations, we need to take those into consideration. 
because that's your grandchildren, your children, your grand great grandchildren, all the way down the line to seven. Hopefully that teaching continues all the way to there. And then it picks up again and starts again for the next seven. Because back then, when I was growing up, it was rough. It was rough at time, as time went on. And I am already at my third generation with my own children. It's myself and my wife, my children, now my grandchildren, that's three. So they still got four more to go generations to hit that seven. And as we grow, I know my time is coming someday. I go and lay with mother, my mother, and that's the graveyard where I go rest wherever. But my teachings will live on through those seven generations. My speaking, my culture, my tradition, everything, our food, the whole thing. So the teaching them. I have a grandson now who's going to take over my pipe, my songs. He's, he's interested. He wants to learn. And he's sitting with me here today, listening to me, right in front of me here. And he's understanding as we grow. So he can continue to his sons and his daughters for that that seven generation is so important as we grow. Same as you people. Same as those people. These people. All these people working together through their own cultures, through their own traditions to understand on how we work together. We can't think of always the bad. Yes, bad things has happened to us. Yes, it's being recognized. Finally, I got to see it. Now we're starting to look at truth and reconciliation to understand where we come from, what we do, why we do these things. And we never greedy. We never take, take, take. We always give, give, give. That's what the seven generations mean. Thank you so much, Elder Paul. And uh, there's a lot of thanks in the, the chat box for your time today. Uh, a lot of people saying thank you for, for joining us, Elder Paul. So uh, we will also have opportunity. We've, we've built time into the program to have opportunity at the end as well to ask any questions that you may have. So we're going to move now into our next presentation, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you to Marcel Arcand. Uh, Marcel is an accomplished Indigenous procurement specialist and an MBA graduate who's who is a dedicated advocate for Indigenous history and rights. With a career spanning over 18 years in administrative and management fields, his passion lies in economic development driving him to foster inclusive opportunities and lasting partnerships for the greater good. In addition to his professional endeavors, Marcel finds joy in family moments and nurtures his creative side, aspiring to delve into script writing and the world of motion pictures. So I will pass the floor over to you now, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shauna. Um, first, I'd like to um, welcome everybody uh, here today. Um, you know, it's very important that we, um, you know, reflect and acknowledge these types of days. And, um, you know, your presence here is a very, very uh, profound uh, statement and important step towards uh, reconciliation. Um, I'd also like to thank the Chamber of Commerce uh, for their initiative and, and kind of walking, you know, the talk. You know, it's very, very um, awesome to see, you know, a prestigious organization like the Alberta Chambers of Commerce kind of taking that that step and, and you know, doing it in a real way. I'd like to thank uh, Elder Paul, um, my dad, uh, you know, for uh, his prayer and his teachings. You know, um, ever since I was a young guy, you know, a little kid, I've been learning this stuff. Um, I've been learning the history of our people, um, learning how to... Uh, walk in two worlds, I guess, so to speak. Uh, it's what the elders called it, is walking in two worlds. Um, many, many years ago, our ancestors, they put down their bows, their arrows, their tomahawks. And um, our, our chiefs at the time who entered into treaty, um, they gave us the tools, um, the, 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 the quill or the whatever they used to put their mark on treaty. They handed that to us today. So now uh, we arm ourselves now with uh, education, um, learning how governments work, how industry works, because it is um, at times tough to navigate. Um, but when you have the foundational teachings and, 
you know, um, the roots so that you can grow the wings, uh, so to speak, uh, mentality and teachings. It, it, it allows you to uh, navigate that a lot easier. Uh, next slide, please. So embracing our culture, um, a big part of reconciliation is, uh, as Elder Paul talked about, is embracing one another, acknowledging each other. Um, we need to celebrate our diversity uh, from all walks of life. Uh, collectively, we are stronger together, you know, when we unite our hearts and our minds. You know, literally, we can move mountains, you know. Uh, today's presentation might be uh, full of a lot of cliches, but they're cliches because a lot of them are true, you know, and um, I think, you know, if we embrace one another in a good way and acknowledge the human element of everybody, I think that um, we'll be able to address reconciliation and moving forward. Uh, acknowledgement of the original people of this land is the first step uh, needed uh, in terms of true reconciliation and as Elder Paul talked about, and as, as you see it more and more, it's starting to happen. Um, and Elder Paul talked about it too, where we're not a greedy people. We don't want everything. We understand um, the medallion um, in um, Elder Paul's presentation, where you see the European and the, um, the uh, First Nation man shaking hands. It's about sharing and working together for tomorrow. Uh, other other things to remember is that our nations, our First Nations, were not under Canada. We're not under the provinces or the territories. We are partners, and we're not subjects of the British Crown. We are partners. We entered into a partnership with the British Crown um, to give access to the land, to, to live in harmony with one another. And um, our ancestors entered into treaty uh, with the British crown and only nations have the ability to treaty. So that's important teachings that get passed on um, along the seven generations as Elder Paul talked about. Uh, my second oldest son is actually upstairs listening um, and he's absorbing all this information and he's uh, demonstrated a real interest in history and politics and business. So when we see that interest, we, we cultivate it, we help grow it, you know, we help pass it on in a good way that does not, you know, create division or anything. It's, it's about unity, you know. Our, um, our culture also teaches us many things, but we do focus on balance and harmony with our planet, Mother Nature. Uh, as Elder Paul talked about, she gives us life, she nourishes us, she nourishes all the people. We need to um, look at the economy and growth and business in a sustainable way where we're not going to poison um, our planet and, and jeopardize uh, the health and safety of our future generations that are yet to come. Thank you. Next slide. So one of the other things that we've talked about now, um, so I wrote uh, my capstone for my master's degree on um, procurement and sustainable procurement. So essentially, we take a look at wealth distribution rather than wealth accumulation. So I'll give you an example. Um, like, uh, say, for instance, like, like uh, tomorrow, Elder Paul is going to go hunting. He's going to take my sons and go hunting. So if Elder Paul, he shoots five moose, for example, we're not going to need all five moose. So we will distribute some of that wealth to our people for those who are unable to hunt and stuff like that. It's, it's about um, distribution of our wealth. That's what we were always taught um, pre-contact. And, you know, um, when our ceremonies were outlawed and stuff like that, we still kind of practiced it underground. Um, but those teachings have never left us. Um, so we have a look at the title of this slide. And that's a very important uh, picture there uh, you see together. Uh, all those people holding hands, all different colors, all different walks of life. So you take a look at the health is wealth um, caption on that slide where you're elevating basic standards of living to promote growth and investment in nation lands. Now, a lot of you, um, you, you probably live on, you know, paved roads and, you know, you have good internet connections, good water systems, good sewer systems, et cetera. 
uh, for stuff for us, for our people, we would consider some of that stuff a luxury in this day and age. But one thing, uh, it does two things. One is it elevates the standard of living for the people in the nations. Also, it um, creates a potential point of investment um, for industry, for governments, for other corporations that are looking to expand their business and work with nations in terms of creating employment, training opportunities, et cetera. And I'll explain that a little bit further into the presentation. So you take a look at capital infrastructure investments. That's your water power, sewer, gas, your road access, all that stuff. That's the nuts and bolts of business. You're, you're not going to have um, sustainable business without those basic infrastructure um, um, tools. Also, a lot of nations in Saskatchewan, and I know that it's been talked about here in Alberta, is taking a look at urban reserve lands. So designating reserve lands in like the city of Edmonton, the city of Calgary, et cetera, Red Deer. Um, a lot of nations have done that in Saskatchewan, and, and it, it does um, add a lot to the economy for everybody, you know. Uh, also, uh, designate lands. I'll explain that a lot more, but uh, what, what a lands designation basically is, is a nation sets aside a certain parcel of land. That land is held in trust by the crown and it's for investment. This way it creates certainty for the investor that chief and counsel or anybody can't just come and kick them out. So they do what's called head lease and sublease systems. And there's a lot of advantages to that, like tax breaks, rent breaks. There's all kinds of different advantages that I'll talk about uh, with designated lands and investing in First Nations. Uh, improved road systems, waste and water systems, uh, sewer systems, gas and electrical systems, improved uh, broadband infrastructure, uh, brick and mortar investments. Now, this is particularly important, especially with dealing with oil and gas. Uh, many times we've been told uh, in negotiations with oil and gas companies when we enter into impact benefit agreements or things like that, is that they don't invest in brick and mortar which is kind of funny because if you go to like, say, for example, the, the city of Whitecourt, there, there's a, there was a big Pembina recreation facility built. I think some of the uh, people raised a ruckus. So I noticed they changed the name. They took Pembina off, but uh, corporate Canada plays a big role here too, you know, and we all know how corporations work. They're all about the bottom line, uh, keeping their shareholders happy, et cetera. But at some point, there's got to be an investment. And I talk about what's called the 3P philosophy uh, later on in the presentation, and I'll kind of expand on that as well. Uh, procurement opportunities for nation businesses. Uh, so a nation's actually authoring these policies. So another thing that I did through my master's was we wrote a toolkit uh, for nations on Indigenous procurement essentially uh, teaching governments, teaching corporate Canada, teaching provincial, federal, municipal governments on what real procurement is, how that looks, how you can capture training opportunities uh, and actually create careers, not just jobs. So we have a very detailed toolkit that myself and my colleague had wrote as part of our master's degree. His name is uh, James Arcan. He's now one of our council members. Um, but we, we worked on this uh, together for a lot of years, and we actually were able to articulate it and put it into our capstone project. And we, you know, we did very well, and, and we're very proud of that, and we're, we're looking to continue to share that message of procurement, what it looks like, and how easily attainable it is, you know. Um, also, um, with building, um, increased capacity building, so when you invest in the people, you see the returns in all different facets. So investing in the people um, creates the environment for success and, and continuity. Uh, you, you, you then create a, uh, an economy that's reciprocal, where, uh, you know, investment, uh, paychecks, et cetera, et cetera, are, you know, circulating within that economy. Um, and also, one thing that's very, very important to remember, and I'm not entirely sure as a younger person, I'm not necessarily young, but I'm, you know, younger, 
Um, one of the things that's always baffled me is that First Nations were not included in Alberta's annual funding. We have what's called target-based funding. So um, our, our funding that we do receive uh, from Alberta is all proposal driven. We're not included in annual budgets, which um, considering the Natural Resources Transfer Act of 1930 is very interesting because the Alberta Heritage Trust Fund, the Alberta Advantage, you guys all remember from a few years ago, that's all built on the oil, the gas, the minerals, the timber, the water of the First Nations people. See, back when our ancestors entered into treaty, they did not want to be a burden to the crown, to the newly forming Canada, or to its citizens. Our ancestors had the wherewithal and the foresight through ceremony to negotiate that Mother Nature would provide for the people. That's why they agreed to share the land to the depth of a plow. And the way elders explained it to me is you hold your two fists like this, that's the plow. Anything underneath that is supposed to belong to us as the original people of this land. Everything above that we agreed to share. And I'll, I'll touch on that kind of later on in my slides. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, talking about the previous slide, I guess, creating the opportunity for investment, for economic growth, where would the funds come from? So again, oil, gas, mineral, timber, royalty revenues from the 1930 NRTA, the dispossession of indigenous wealth. That's where the, the federal government, without consultation of any kind, they, they created the 1930 Natural Resources Transfer Act, and they transferred all authority and jurisdiction in quotations because we've never relinquished that of our oil, our gas, our minerals, our timber to the provinces. Because when the provinces were created, they didn't really have a set or established revenue source to sustain them. So that's what the federal um, strategy was at the time was to transfer that and, and to be able to fund and sustain the provinces. But we were never consulted and we were never um, uh, compensated uh, for that dispossession. At the time of treaty making, our ancestors negotiated our wealth and sources of revenue that would care for our people and knew this would come from Mother Earth. The other thing too, where this could come from for creating and promoting investment in nations and surrounding uh, towns and municipalities is through carbon royalty revenues. And I, you know, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of hit and miss with the viewpoints on carbon royalty revenues, but you might as well put it to good use while it's being, um, I guess, uh, deployed right now. Uh, municipal, uh, provincial fees, permits, licenses, etc. So, for example, Alexander First Nation, we're su surrounded in our main reserve here by four municipalities. We've got Sturgeon County. Westlock County, Lac St. Anne County, and Parkland County. Now, I've actually done the research. So I know that Sturgeon County, through taxes, licenses, permits, fees, etc., I know that they generate roughly 100 to $120 million a year in revenue through these means. So I, I, I got asked a question one time by their CAO. Uh, he'd asked me, uh, Marcel, what would be the ultimate kind of sign of respect an acknowledgement that we're on your land. And I told him, well, I have an idea. <laughs> so all the permits, the licenses, the taxes, et cetera, et cetera, there should be a portion of that that goes to nations for capital improvements, for roads, water, sewer, gas, and all that stuff. And I told them, make it very clear that this is not for operations or housing or all that stuff because there's other venues for that this is about promoting growth to affect and grow regional in on on how our nations work with our partners that surround us because i always say that we're not vatican city nations our doors are open and we're looking we're not our own countries our own entities we are our own sovereign nations 
but we are about partnerships and building those partnerships. The uh, handshakes got to be returned though. You know, we can reach our hands out, but there's got to be somebody there on the other end to shake our hand, right? Uh, lending institutions as well. Uh, one thing that we found out during our master's course is that a lot of lending institutions, their practices, their, their standard um, lending practices and stuff, they kind of, they don't really look at the complexity of First Nations and how um, their different funding sources, like, and I'll give you an example. So for one, um, we had an issue uh, with one of our cash flows um, for, uh, with the federal government. And the bank at the time, not understanding that we get funded on a monthly basis, it's like our cash flow comes on a monthly basis. That they, they uh, was a, like a, like a, like a mistake, you know, but once we had the chance to kind of sit down with them and explain how things work and uh, how the funding works and stuff like that, they were, they kind of released the lien. Like we had liens on our school buses and things like that. Um, but that was just a misconception, right? You know, an, an institution like a, like a banking institution, not understanding uh, the complexity of, um, you know, how First Nations work. But, you know, once you sit down and explain it, you know, things went well and, they, and they're very smooth after. Um, the First Nations Development Fund. Um, so this, for many of you who don't know, uh, for those of you who don't know, the First Nations Development Fund is a portion of the revenues from the First Nations casinos. Um, and I think there's five in the province of Alberta. Uh, six, I think, now coming on with Ochis coming on in Red Deer. Um, so the First Nations Development Fund is uh, the gaming revenues that are generated through the First Nations casinos. Um, they go to this First Nations Development Fund. Over a billion dollars of that goes back into the government of Alberta. If you ask me, a billion dollars is a lot to pay for a casino license, you know, and nations always had the inherent jur jurisdiction and authority to be the authors of their own economic development. And that's evidenced and reinforced in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So what we're saying is that this billion dollars, like Alberta, like they should reinvest that back into the nations because the non-native casinos, you know what they contribute back to the First Nations? Zero, not one dollar. Our casinos contribute over a billion dollars to the Alberta government. And that needs to change. We need to change that formula. The uh, interesting uh, bullet here is at the very bottom. No taxpayers' dollars at all. Not one penny. That's not what we negotiated when we entered into treaty. Like I said, our ancestors knew that Mother Nature would provide for the people. And from what I understand, um, no taxpayers' dollars fund anything on nations as is it should be. This is a grossly exaggerated misconception through many media platforms, and it is simply not true. We get absolutely zero dollars from taxpayers. I'm not sure how the Canadian Municipalities Association or the Alberta Municipal Taxpayers, uh, where, where this information comes from, because we know that we get a portion of our funding from what Elder, talk, Elder Paul talked about is the Consolidated Revenue Fund. So all the royalties, everything that um, is collected from the earth, oil, gas, mineral, diamonds, everything, it goes into that Consolidated Revenue Fund. And Alberta, through the natural dollars that Alberta pays or transfers to the feds, so we don't ask for taxpayers' dollars. We do not want um, taxpayers' dollars. That, that has never been the case. And all levels of government, as an additional call to action, I call upon all levels of government to dispel this rumor because it is simply not true. And it is a tool of division. Like I said, that is not true. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, this is a very powerful quote, and it kind of in line. It's in line with uh, today's message of collective and unity and strength and all that stuff. Uh, a lot of you guys know uh, JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, very celebrated uh, president in the United States, uh, where he talks about we have come to realize in modern times that the melting pot need not mean the end of particular ethnic identities or traditions. So one thing um, at this day and age, at this point in time, and it's good that it's gaining traction is the term indigenous. You know, it's a universally understood term and it's okay for now. What I mean by that is that there's distinct people. We have distinct identities. It looks, and, and we view it as a melting pot when the governments use the term indigenous or aboriginal because we are not Métis. We are not Inuit. They are their own separate, unique, distinct people with their own unique, distinct traditions, culture, and customs. As First Nations people, there's e an even further um, distinction. We are Cree here in Alexander. There's Cree, there's Soto, there's, you know, Sioux. There's all kinds of different uh, tribes within the First Nations. Um, with the Inuit, they're a separate people. The Métis, they're a separate people. It's just that now the term Indigenous is a universally accepted term that, you know, talks about the original people. One thing that you'll see later on is that nations will begin to start to make that distinction. So what is the best way to relay this message to Canada, the provinces, industry, and institutions in a way that fosters the spirit of collaboration and not division. But we must remember the distinction. And the answer is right there in that picture. And I chose that picture very um, purposefully. And it's listening with your heart. So that there is what kind of what we're talking about is the getting kind of the, the truth from, you know, from the people who live it. And, you know, we go through this kind of on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here uh, we get into what's called the 3P philosophy. Uh, a lot of you probably have seen this. Uh, this is kind of a, a more sustainable uh, way in which large corporations, some of them, not all of them, even kind of the medium and smaller uh, businesses are starting to embrace uh, the sustainability of operating their businesses, but also doing it in a way that does not kind of overdo it uh, for Mother Nature. Uh, so the 3P philosophy basically is people, planet, profit. Uh, the three P's of sustainability are a well-known and accepted business concept. Uh, the P's refer to people, planet, profit, also referred to as the triple bottom line. Uh, sustainability has the role of protecting and maximizing the benefit of the three P's. This is importantly uh, important uh, considering that the footprints we make today our guiding steps for tomorrow. So as Elder Paul talked about, uh, we're passing through this land. Uh, our ancestors, um, they created a trail for us uh, today here um, and everybody's ancestors. It is our duty and incumbent upon us to make that trail easier to walk on and to make it wider so that more of us can walk it. Um, they acknowledge the planet's needs by respecting its valuable resources and they aim to produce profit without waste. So here it's all about sustainable uh, business, right? Um, next slide, please. Uh, this here is another important uh, quote that, that, that reflects the contribution of individuals, corporations to the, um, the national uh, product. The, the, the revenue of a country or an economy or a regional economy, et cetera. So uh, this, this hits perfectly and is in perfect alignment with some of the teachings and philosophies that we learn 
um, through the seven generational teachings that Elder Paul talked about. So imagine life is a game in which you are juggling some five balls in the air. You name them work, family, health, friends, and spirit. And you're keeping all these in the air. You will soon understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. But the other four balls are made of glass. If you drop one of these, they will be irrevocably scuffed, marked, nicked, damaged, or even shattered. They will never be the same. You must understand that and strive for balance in your life. And this, of course, was by Byron Dyson, uh, former vice chair and COO of Coca-Cola. Now, can you imagine, you know, a guy or a person at that kind of level of business and, and having that perspective, understanding that, you know, there's your health, your family, your friends, your children, and you know, whether you're happy in what you're doing and stuff like that, rather than just being, you know, a mindless drone, just going to work, you know, not looking after yourself, not looking after your mental health, et cetera. But that's a very powerful statement, especially from somebody at that level of business who's dealing with billions and billions of dollars, you know. So it's important to never forget yourself, you know, your health. Think about yourself. Think about your contributions to your children, to your family, to your community, to your, you know, what, what are you contributing and are you doing it in a good way? Next slide, please. Uh, so here uh, we see how what we're talking about, how it can, how it it's put on paper, and how we can enact this stuff uh, through these logic models. It talks about the human element of people contributing to economies, uh, whether it's um, uh, regional or, or, or sorry, local, regionally or nationally. There's all these different factors. So you take a look at the inputs that create the outputs and then the impact of the outcomes. So uh, this, this will be made uh, available for everybody who wants it. And you can start to study that, you know, and you can start to formulate your own, um, your own ways of how this would work with First Nations people and reconciliation. Um, uh, and if you need assistance and help, please feel free to reach out. Um, this is kind of one of the things I do for a living is help build these strategies and these models on how to engage with nations and how to, you know, utilize to the best um, ability of everybody and for the benefit of everybody on to create that long lasting reciprocal impact, whether it's training jobs, the economy, business, etc. There's just so many opportunities and um, like I said, we're not, you know, our own little independent entities. Our doors are open for business, you know, and definitely, you know, you knock on those doors. We knock on the doors. Let's, you know, let's let's collaborate and work together on that, you know. But uh, to get kind of further detailed into this, uh, please uh, ask um, the chamber staff to make this available. And, and they will. Both of our presentations are for you know everybody to read and understand uh thank you uh next slide please uh now this quote uh, is uh something that i came up with uh this marcel arcan guy is very brilliant and handsome and one of the smartest guys i know no i'm just kidding um but like like what we talk about right so for many years nations were um i can't remember how the way to say it in gaelic i think it's Send fine ourselves alone, I think is, I, I might be butchering that, but I remember that ourselves alone. But now we're starting to come together and the collaboration is growing and it's just so awesome to see. And Elder Paul talked and said the word Akamimo could keep going, keep continuing down that path of uh, truth and reconciliation. There's an important um, word and I know a lot of times the focus is on the word reconciliation, but above the uh, chamber uh, staff there, you'll see that other word truth. And that's exactly what we're um, um, teaching today is the truth from our perspective, our oral testimony from our elders that's been passed down. It's been passed to uh, my father. It's been passed to me. We're passing it to our younger generations, my sons, my nieces. That is our duty 
we talk about if you have the ability, you also have the responsibility to pass these messages on in a good way. So one arrow is easy to snap. But if we gather many arrows, we are unbreakable. This is true in all aspects of life, especially in collective business and opportunity in our lands. And this is, of course, something that I came up with. I was thinking of the theme of uh, today's presentation, and this just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, so together we're strong. I want to leave that uh, message and, and hopefully that resonates with everybody. Next slide, please. So also, I'd like to acknowledge the significant step taken by the Alberta Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Shauna and her staff are just, you know, making leaps and bounds and, and kind of being the leaders, you know, in, in, in reconciliation and acknowledgement of the original people of this land. And it's good to see it's being done in a real way. So as part of the larger equ equity uh, diversion and inclusion strategy, uh, what Shauna refers to as the EDI strategy, the Alberta Chambers of Commerce will be forming an Indigenous Business Committee in order to authentically engage in economic and social uh, reconciliation. Education, programs, see that's the, the truth part there that I talk about, and advocacy will be all uh, part of the identified outcomes of this committee. Um, we will be, uh, they'll be setting uh, out the terms of engagement for the committee and recruiting participating members over the next six months and then convening the committee to determine the first projects and priorities. So this is nations authoring their own destiny and it's a huge step and it's very important. If there's anybody from the provincial, federal, municipal governments, please take note. This is how it's done. You engage, you ask, that's, that's the way to do it. And, and you'll understand like um, Elder Paul talked about, we're not greedy people. We don't want everything and all of it, you know. Um, it's just to share, to be at the table. That's basically all we want. Because this conflict, this us versus them, all it's doing is feeding the legal industry. You know, comprehensive claims, suing the government, all this stuff. It just doesn't make sense anymore. It's not economically feasible. All it does is make lawyers rich. I'm sorry if there's any lawyers in the gallery, but... You know, it, it, you think about it, right? What is the definition of insanity? And this conflict has been fueled and ongoing since contact. There's no need for this anymore. Our capacity as First Nations people has grown. We've got lawyers. We've got all kinds of people who are educated in all kinds of fields. There's our, our European brothers and sisters. They have educated people as well. Collectively, with the teachings and guidance, we can work together. Uh, this is an excellent and uplifting initiative uh, that will engage Indigenous peoples in advocacy for investment in our lands and promoting Indigenous entrepreneurship within a prestigious organization. So the Alberta Chambers of Commerce is a prestigious organization, and it's good that they're taking that lead. You know, it's it's awesome. I can't stress the um, the hope that we have in, in like an organization like the ACC taking the lead on this. Uh, again, uh, we'd like to commend the Alberta Chamber of Commerce for their walking the talk in terms of action and reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples of this land. And this is a powerful and genuine first step. So again, thank you to you and your team. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first Nation land investment opportunities. Uh, so here I'll get into the specifics of how to invest in First Nations. So reserve land, all of the reserve land is held in trust by his majesty and set aside for the use and benefit of a band. And this is wording directly from the Indian Act. Um, before reserve land can be leased to a third party, it must be designated to the federal crown. What a land designation is, is there um, a nation votes, eligible voters, they vote to designate X amount of parcel of acres of a land uh, for investment. So this gives comfort uh, to the investor that they're not gonna get their lease hijacked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, so it creates a certainty for the investor. 
A third, a third party includes all corporations, including band owned corporations. ISC must ensure that the rights and interests of First Nation and other affected parties are respected. So once the land has been designated, a head lease must be completed on the designated parcel of land within the First Nation. The nation or land corporation, nation corporation, whichever is utilized by the nation, can then issue a sublease to an interested party for investment into the lands. Uh, significant advantages include that a lot of red tape is at the discretion of leadership and not subject to fee simple type legislation and regulations. So one of the things like if you're going to invest in like, you know, a, a non Indigenous town or something, there, there might be a lot of red tape, depending on the regulations and statutes that that mayor or that council uh, have. Um, so uh, one second, just. Sorry about that. Uh, timer on the TV kicked on and I didn't want to distract everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, there's significant tax advantages. Uh, chiefs and councils, they can set their own tax rate. Uh, for investors, it could be 0%. It could be 1%. Uh, that is determined by the chief and council. Uh, there's significant lease advantages. For example, negotiation might be with a big company. Like if you help with the roads, the water, power, sewer, gas, We'll lease you uh, the land for, and this is just hypothetical, for example, a uh, dollar a year for the first five years. You know, there, there's all different kinds of things that you can negotiate uh, within that. Uh, subleases can be issued up to 99 years and extended through a band council resolution or what's called a BCR. Uh, typically, nations have a pool of labor ready to work investment and construction opportunities. So, like, again, the opportunities there... Um, a lot of times uh, with um, oil and gas companies, et cetera, these opportunities are available. Um, at, at certain times, it, we kind of view it where oil and gas companies, they're trying to get approval and access for as cheap as possible. And a lot of times nations are trying to get the best deal that they can for their nations, their people, their future, et cetera. Um, so just come together. You know, it's a simple kind of solution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a uh, measurement to support a balanced uh, 3P economy. And this is the individual, uh, the spoke, I guess, uh, com contributing to the larger wheel. So we got to take a look at, make sure that that person is emotionally, spiritually, physically, and mentally, you know, good and sound. Um, the emotional is the safety of the future. Spiritual is a cultural connection. Uh, some people don't believe or, you know, that's entirely up to them. It is not incumbent upon us to force or our beliefs or anything on people. They believe whatever they believe, uh, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, the physical as well, you got to be healthy in order to contribute in a good way. Uh, so at, at all times, please take care of your health and your mental health as well. Uh, next slide, please. So indigenomics, uh, this is a very famous term um, coined by Carol Ann Hilton. Uh, she was actually one of our instructors at Simon Fraser University. Very smart lady. Uh, gets into detail, details about the literal trillions of dollars that are there uh, to contribute um, for all walks of life in all types of industry. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you have read her book, but definitely Google her name. Um, she's a very brilliant lady, and she talked a lot about in depth uh, about the opportunity for everybody. Um, the indigenomics uh, draws on the ancient principles that have supported indigenous economies for thousands of years and works to implement them as modern business practices. So there with that thinking, you see the evolution of our people and our thinking and realizing that today the world is different. We need to walk in two worlds, as the elders call it. And there, uh, table one, and again, this, this presentation will be made available for everybody. Um, it talks about the 12 steps, the 12 levers for growth of the Indigenous economy. Now, think about the inroads and the collaboration and the partnerships that could be made with the local and surrounding economies. 
So this is a very, very, uh, not necessarily new concept, but it is something that uh, Dr. Hilton has crafted to perfection. Um, so with that, um, that's the presentation. And uh, thank you again, everybody for listening. Um, I hope, you know, we shared some uh, teachings with everybody and, uh, you know, uh, may the creator bless everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel. And so we have about 15 minutes uh, for any questions that anybody may have for either Elder Paul or Marcel. And again, I just wanna reiterate that uh, these presentations will be made available and uh, uh, the chamber folks have our um, contact information. If anybody wants to reach out or anything, please feel free to, you know, we're available. Um, so yeah, thank you. Excellent. Again, thanks, Marcel, for your generosity and in, in offering that out to our network. Uh, you know, you and I have talked quite a bit uh, as we look at setting up um, our Indigenous Business Committee, uh, our Indigenous Economic Committee. We haven't, I think that's going to be one of the first things that the committee will do is decide actually what their name is going to be. Uh, we're not going to put that, that label on there, but uh, we're really excited to do that work and explore further how we can, um, you know, really engage in authentic uh, truth and reconciliation as an organization and how we can support our members across the province to do so as well. Uh, so we had a couple comments in the chat. Um, just thank you for the presentation. I look forward to receiving the slide deck and presentation to share out. Uh, another individual, and I'm anxious to share this with our newly elected executive and board at our orientation retreat next weekend. So uh, excellent. It's going to be redistributed. The other thing uh, also, uh, this has been recorded. So anybody who is not able to join us today, we're going to be uh, sending that out into the network uh, for anybody who wanted to uh, hear the teachings and learnings that we, we shared with Elder Paul and Marcel today. So I'm not seeing any hands or any questions in the chat box. Uh, so with that, then, uh, I, again, I can't thank both of you enough for joining us today. Um, it's just so invaluable for us to hear um, hear your teachings. Uh, and, and obviously, the wisdom that you've shared has really enriched us uh, today as we look at um, celebrating tomorrow, Truth and Reconciliation Day. So with that, I'm very excited to... Uh, close our event with a song from Elder Paul. Elder Paul? You are on mute, Elder. The song that I'm going to do is an Oskumpton song, thanking the Creator, mm -hmm. hoping that this today is a turning point for our people to the truth and reconciliation and that the chambers will understand where we are coming from now, from our slides and our discussion here with everyone that's involved in this meeting right now. Hoping that tomorrow will bring a better day if we could really work together and try to understand where we come from and how we want to participate like Marcel Arcan said, we're not looking for a handout. We're looking to be involved. And the NRTA and the Indian Money's Trust Fund, those are some of the things that we are asking to start paying our way, just to get our share and have economic prosperity in every one of our First Nations that we live in. So hoping through the prayer and the song that all of you understand to assist us and ask us to participate. And we will be more than happy to assist the ACC to have a better an understanding. So this song is kind of a round dance song with a cultural component in there. So, and it's called Naskumpton. Thank you, the creator.
Thank you very much for listening to me. You guys all have a great day. And I hope your fires are burning well at home. And for the future of all your babies and ours. Hey, hey, not scooping them, Scott. No, hey, hey. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Elder Paul and Marcel for joining us today. And I want to thank everybody who joined us on the call as well. Uh, I, I know that you would have found some a great knowledge transfer in terms of how we move forward uh, as an organization and as a, a group of member organizations uh, in the province to really support authentic truth and reconciliation. So again, thank you to everybody. We hope you enjoyed this session and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>